please stand for the reading of the scripture. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die, because he has made himself the Son of God.
just paid it for what you did on the cross. We thank you for the debt that you paid, for the blood that you shed, for our salvation and our forgiveness. We thank you tonight in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. We come to a scene where Jesus is betrayed, arrested, and bound. And under normal circumstances, this would mean defeat. But Jesus succeeds where Adam failed. Jesus enters a garden and surrenders himself to this betrayal. Judas often met there with Jesus and the other disciples in the garden, but this time Judas comes with a band of soldiers, chief priests and Pharisees, armed with torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, did not shrink in fear of his assignment, but came forward and said to them, whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am. Jesus uses this unique phrase in the Greek meaning I am, I am. The Greek translation of the Old Testament uses the same unique phrase for the name of God, Yahweh, in Exodus 3.14. I am who I am. When Jesus spoke this, he was claiming deity for himself. Jesus said, I am who I am, and they drew back and fell to the ground. Even those who come to oppose him, it is at the name of Jesus that I am, that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. 
this mob comes to arrest Jesus, yet from the moment they arrived, they were arrested by his authority. Jesus is fully in control. So he asked them again, whom do you seek? And they said to him, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus answered, I told you that I am. So if you seek me, let these men go. You see, Jesus made no attempt to flee, although he could have. He could have even allowed his disciples to fight, but he didn't. Peter draws his sword and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear, and Jesus says, put your sword away, Peter. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? And like a lamb led to the slaughter, he opened not his mouth but went passively to his death. Jesus enters a garden and surrenders himself, not by force, but by his self-surrendered will in order to drink the cup of suffering from the Father for your salvation. So they arrested him and bound him. Jesus, the one who spoke the world into existence, willingly bound by men created in his own image, surrendered to the betrayal of one of his own friends. Jesus, the great I am, the suffering servant king. Jesus, the lamb of God, worthy is his name. something in all of us that loves a redemption story. We all know of people, relationships, or painful situations that we think will never get better. It seems impossible. But when the impossible happens, we absolutely love being wrong. Anyone in this room could pick up a Bible and read John 18 and learn about Jesus' disciple Peter, and likely the most shameful thing he ever did. See, when Jesus needed a friend most, Peter abandoned him, and 2,000 years later, this decision is still what he's remembered for. Today's young people can relate to Peter with the power and longevity of social media. It's overwhelming feeling permanently defined by a moment, a decision, or a foolish response. Peter needs redemption. His story is that he told Jesus that he would lay down his life for him, but Jesus corrects him and predicted that instead he would deny him three times before the rooster crowed. 
and Jesus' prediction about Peter comes true. Peter followed the soldiers who had bound up and arrested Jesus and taken him to the high priest. And Peter silently looked on while Jesus is being illegally questioned and hit across the face by a soldier. And in these moments, Peter denies being Jesus' disciple first to a servant girl. Then while standing around a fire, he denies being Jesus' disciple to other servants. And when another servant asks him about knowing Jesus and being with him in the garden, he denies it all a third time. And at once a rooster crowed. We find out in Mark, Matthew, and Luke that after this happened, Peter took off and wept. And there are a few common responses we have or commentators have about this. Some think if we were in the same situation, we would never abandon him. Some think about how pathetic Peter is and call him a coward. Some connect with Peter and see all the ways that we deny knowing Jesus by how we live or by how we treat people. But I don't wanna talk bad about Peter and I think we miss the point if we only think of the ways that we would respond. I want us to think about what Jesus knew in the midst of all of this. Jesus already knew what Peter was going to do. He already knew and he still loved him. He still had plans for him and he still went to the cross for him. Jesus knew that although Peter denied him, Peter would learn from Jesus what being willing to lay down his life means. He knew Peter's fears, his betrayal, his deepest sin. He knew his very worst, and he knew Peter's repentant heart too. Jay Hooker says, being repentant doesn't mean that you no longer sin. Being repentant means you love Christ more than your sin. We won't be sinless, but if we love him more than our sin, we grow. We will actually sin less. The next time Peter was around a fire, it was after Jesus died and rose again and he came to the disciples. And around this fire, Jesus gives Peter the opportunity for redemption. Jesus asked Peter, do you love me three times? And Peter says, yes, three times, one for each denial. Can you imagine how Jesus' love and mercy made Peter feel in that moment? Just incredible, free from shame, forgiven and restored. It makes perfect sense that later when he is sent out to teach about Jesus, Peter says in Acts 2, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. So if we have been or are feeling far off from Jesus, if we have sin, we love more than him, Jesus wants to give us a redemption story like Peter, and nothing is impossible with him, but there is no redemption without a redeemer. The invitation to hope is to believe that we have a holy God who knows us, sees us at our worst, and he still came to save us.
Then the chief priests and their officials took Jesus to Pilate, the Roman governor, because the Jewish leaders didn't have the authority to execute Jesus. Pilate was not confused. He knew Jesus was not deserving of death. Several times he tried to set Jesus free, but the religious leaders manipulated Pilate into carrying out their malicious intent. John chapter 19 begins with these eight words. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. Eight simple words, but they speak of horrific torture and torment and hideous trauma beyond one's imagining. For a Roman flogging, they first stripped the victim and tied his hands to a post above his head. And the whips they used were made of several strips of leather embedded with pieces of bone and metal. Two men, one on each side of the victim, usually did the flogging. The Jews limited flogging to 40 stripes. The Romans had no such limitation. There was no part of the body that would not be subjected to the ripping out of pieces of flesh. The flesh of the torso, the legs, the face, even eyes would be torn out. It made a bloody pulp of a man's body. After the flogging, Jesus was beaten by the Roman soldiers who repeatedly hit him in the face, forced a crown of thorns upon his head and mocked him, Hail, King of the Jews! And after the flogging and the beating, Pilate tries again to set Jesus free by bringing him out in front of the crowd at a place called the Stone Pavement. The prophet Isaiah described this very moment 700 years earlier. Isaiah says, but many were amazed when they saw him. His face was so disfigured they could see, he hardly seemed that he was human. From his appearance, one could scarcely know that he was a man. On Monday, June 21st, 2010, I was in Jerusalem. On that day, I had the sober privilege of spending three hours near the place where Pilate presented Jesus to the bloodthirsty crowd demanding his crucifixion. The mutilated, bleeding God-man Jesus stood on the very stones where I was that day, and I spent three hours there asking the Lord to press this reality into my soul. This is God. This is God. Oh, men and women, this is God giving himself up and puts his hands up on the post to undergo a scourging so vicious, so brutal, and so prolonged that by the time they were done whipping him, no one even knew he was like a human. As you gaze on your king and creator, taking the torturous scourging that you and I deserve. Let me ask you, are you loved? Does he care? Does he really care for you? Oh my, yes. As the brutalized, bleeding Jesus is placed by Pilate on what is called the stone pavement before the hostile crowd that day, but also before us this evening, before tender worshiping hearts, Pilate says, here is your king.
Jesus' interaction with Pilate is definitely some of the most fascinating dialogue in the Bible. As you watch Jesus interact, interact with him, it becomes very clear that in the mind and heart of Jesus that he and his father were in full control of everything that was happening. Jesus says to Pilate in John 19, 11, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Jesus had told him at an earlier portion of his questioning, for this purpose I was born. For this purpose I have come into the world. And so as we reach John 19, verse 16, the moment comes where Pilate delivers him over to be crucified. Now, all of this reveals that, that Jesus, as he's experiencing all of this, is not only being acted upon, but he is deliberately taking action. They did not take his life from him. He laid down his life. And this is what Good Friday is all about. Verses 17 and 18 of John 19. So they took Jesus... And he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. And there they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side and Jesus between them. As you move to the end of John 19, we are given some extraordinary insight into the very end of the process. Right as Jesus is dying, what is Jesus thinking? What is Jesus experiencing as he hangs on the cross and dies? We're told in verses 28 through 30. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now accomplished, said, to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. I imagine that after Jesus rose from the dead, John must have asked him, what were you thinking? What were you experiencing as you died? It's the only way John could have known some of these things. I wish I could have been there when Jesus shared these experiences with John, but three things are revealed in Jesus' words. When Jesus died, he was accomplishing. When he died, he was fulfilling. And when he died, he was finishing. In the consciousness of Jesus, the whole experience is one of achievement. In his dying moments, the mind of Jesus is filled not with hopeless despair, but with a sense of accomplishment. This is what he'd come to do. This is what his father had sent him for. This was his life's goal, to give his life as a ransom for many. Throughout his life, almost everybody tried to stop him from getting here. From Herod when he was a baby, to the devil in the wilderness, to his friend and disciple Peter, to his own mother and family, to his own worst moment as he prayed the night he was betrayed in Gethsemane, to Pilate trying to release him, and finally to the two thieves dying next to him, mocking him to save himself. But despite all of this, nothing could stop him. He had to accomplish it. He had to fulfill the prophecies. He had to finish the task. His final words, it is finished, echo the final words of Psalm 22, written about him almost a thousand years earlier. Psalm 22, 31. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, that he has done it. What has he done? What did he accomplish? The answers are the greatest realities a human heart can ever know and believe. 
He bore the full punishment for sin so that sinners like us can be forgiven. He defeated all the demonic powers of evil that crush, invade, and and destroy our lives. He destroyed death itself. He purchased eternal life for all who believe. He provided power for peace so that the enemies of God could be reconciled both to him and each other. And he guaranteed the full and final restoration of all creation. Jesus gave up his spirit for us. He dealt with sin. All sin, my sin, your sin, all that is left for us is to believe and receive. It is finished. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Got me? There we go. Well, it's good to be with you guys. My name is Josh. I work uh, with the student ministries here at Good Shepherd. uh, And I'm really thankful that you guys are here. I think there's something that we can all agree on. And that is that relationships are some of the most important things in all of life. Whether it be a relationship with a spouse or a friend or a family member or even a coworker. Relationships are highly valuable and oftentimes extremely enjoyable. However, I think that we can also agree that relationships, they come with a price. For instance, my wife and I, we went to school in Southern California and we made some of our best friends down there. I mean, people who were in our wedding, people whose weddings we've been in, and we have a ton of shared experiences with these people. But now we live over a thousand miles away from them and we don't get to see them much. So in order to maintain our relationship with them, our friends, they have spent their time and their money to come up and visit us. And that's been the cost of a relationship with us. Or even in marriage, what my wife and I are learning is if we wanna have a happy and healthy marriage, there's some things you gotta be willing to lay down. And it could be small preferences, right? Like, does the toilet paper roll go over or under? (laughs) Over, okay, okay. We're also an over people too. Um, Or for us, it's should our Legos be out in our living room so people can see them 
or should we tuck them away in our closets so nobody knows that we have them? But there's also more serious things that we've had to, we've had to get, we had sac- be willing to sacrifice. Things like, well, whose parents are we gonna go spend the holidays with? My in-laws, they live uh, up in Alaska, so that's a little bit of context for you. Or like, what should our budget look like? These things and many others are considered to be the cost of marriage. And it requires things like humility, selflessness, and sacrifice. Now, the thing about relationships is every one of them comes with a cost. And that cost, it may be large or it may be small, but whatever that cost may be, if you're willing to pay it, it's because you believe that it's worth it. Today, we celebrate Good Friday, which marks the day in human history that Jesus, the Son of God, paid the ultimate price for a relationship with us. And tonight, we're gonna spend some time in John chapter 12 as we uncover the price of eternal life and the glory that will come from it. But before we get into it, will you guys take a moment and pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to your word with humility. Lord, we just ask that you would fill this place, that you would enter this room. Lord, that that we would be able to take a moment and reflect on the sacrifice that your son made. Lord, thank you for your son. It's in your name that we pray, amen. Now, leading up to our passage tonight, Jesus has been a little busy. He has just healed this guy named Lazarus who was dead and brought back to life four days after he passed away. And news of this miracle, it began to spread in the surrounding areas and even made its way into Jerusalem where Jesus was heading to next. And as Jesus enters into Jerusalem, people, a huge crowd comes and, and they wanna be around him and they're praising him, calling him things like King of Israel or miracle worker. And there's this small group of Greeks that wanna have a conversation with them. And so they go up to his disciples and they ask if they can speak with Jesus. And, and Jesus sees them and he says to them, my hour has come. Now this hour that Jesus is talking about is the hour of his death. It was no longer on the horizon, but it was now here. And starting in verse 24 of John 12, Jesus says to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Now it seems like it should be kind of backwards, right? Like in order for wheat to bear fruit and, need, and be fruitful, it needs to die. It shouldn't be alive. The Greeks that Jesus is speaking to are most likely farmers. So people who understand agriculture and they, they know what it's like to, to harvest wheat. And so this analogy, it, it meets them where they're at. It, it kind of reminds me of when I was a little kid and I'd run out to my parents' front lawn and I would pluck a little dandelion from the ground. And when you do this, you can't help but just bring it up and blow on it and and, and make a wish, right? Now, two things I didn't realize I was doing in this. One, I didn't realize that dandelions were a seed or or were a weed. So, and then two, that I was now spreading its seed all over our front lawn, causing little weeds to pop up later on, which didn't really make my mom super happy. But the thing about dandelions is in order for them to spread, it needs to die first. Jesus, he's talking about his coming death in our passage. And what, we, what he knows is that if he wishes to bear much fruit, if he wishes to, to make, make it possible for eternal life for his followers, then he is going to have to sacrifice. He is going to have to die. Now, what this communicates to us about Jesus is that he saw the price of a relationship with us and he considered that price to be worth it. 
that we, even in our sin and our shame, we are more valuable to Jesus Christ than his own life and his own breath. I mean, can we sit in that for a second? You and I being created in the image of God for the glory of God are of more value to Jesus than life itself. In verses 25 and 26, Jesus, he goes on to explain what will, what will happen to us if, if we embrace this love that he has for us. Starting in 25, he says, whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the father will honor him. This is the call of Jesus's love. He laid down his own life and showed us his great love for us. And now he is asking us to do the same. How we respond will determine whether or not we receive eternal life or we lose our lives. This is the mystery of Good Friday. Jesus wasn't, wasn't losing his life by dying on the cross, but he was gaining eternal life and making the way for us to receive eternal life by dying on the cross. That was the payment. The question is, is how will you respond? You know, I think our problem far too often is that we love life just enough that there are things in our lives we're not actually willing to give up. That we want and even need a relationship with Jesus, but we feel as if the price for that relationship can sometimes be a little bit too high. When I was in high school, I had a few friends who lived like this. They liked the idea of a relationship with Jesus, but they loved, they, they, they loved the empty promises of this world more. They thought that eternal life in heaven was appealing, but the instant gratification of sin, it was more tempting. And through years, through small sacrifices, and through avoiding conviction, my friends in an attempt to gain the entire world ended up forfeiting their soul. If you know people like this, it's heartbreaking to watch. Seeing them choose a life on earth, a life of sin rather than a life with Christ. But while studying this passage, I couldn't help but think how might I still be doing this too? In what ways am I choosing to live for myself, to live a life in this world rather than living my life for Christ? I think for each of us, this idea of hating our lives in this world can sometimes feel a little bit too much. Like when it comes to our comfort, we may find it in the amount of money that we have rather than the inheritance that we share with Christ. Or for our joy, we may search for it in our day-to-day -day situations rather than searching for it in the presence of God. Or maybe we look for our purpose in our jobs or our human relationships rather than finding our purpose in how God sees us and what he's called us to do. Whatever it may be for you, laying it down each and every day and dying to yourself is the cost of a relationship with Jesus. In order for us to get this right, we gotta begin to look at our lives on earth differently and view God differently. And it's not that we think less of ourselves and we think more of God, but it's that our heart's deepest desire 
isn't for more earthly comfort or more earthly joy, but it's for whatever will draw us nearer to the person and presence of God. That's why in verse 26, Jesus gives us the reason as to why we should live this way. If we seek and serve, to f- seek and serve Jesus in every aspect of our lives, what Jesus promises is that we're gonna receive honor from the Father. And, and that honor, we will be able to experience it in its fullness in his presence in heaven one day. But in order to get there, you must be willing to place God as number one in your life and faith in Jesus as number one in your life and ourselves as secondary. D.A. Carson has a wonderful quote on this uh, in his commentary on John. He says, self must be displaced by another. The endless, shameless focus on self must be displaced by focus on Jesus Christ, who is the supreme revelation of God. As Jesus' crucifixion is the path to his glorification, so the believer's death is the path to vindication. Taking ourselves, our worries, our needs, our desires, and laying them at the feet of Jesus in faith is the price of a relationship. The question is, how will you respond? Are you willing to do this? Are you truthfully willing to place God on the highest pedestal in your life and die to yourself and put yourself down so that you may receive honor from the Father? If you wish to follow Jesus into the gates of heaven, you must first be willing to follow him on the road to Calvary. Now I get it. It may be hard and it may be troubling, but that is exactly what Jesus was experiencing leading up to his death on the cross. In verses 27 through 28, Jesus says, now is my soul troubled and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose, I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. The word troubled in the Greek here is pronounced terasso, and it means to be stirred up or to be unsettled. And what we see in this verse is Jesus's humanness. Jesus is deeply unsettled with what's about to come. I mean, he's about to experience pain that no other man or no other woman in all of earth has ever experienced before. But he's not, just wor- he's not just troubled by the coming pain, physical pain that he's about to endure, but he's troubled by the spiritual weight of every sin that ever has and ever will be committed. You see, Jesus, Jesus bore the weight of the world's sin on his shoulders as he hung naked on a cross and he, he died. He experienced separation from the Father and bore the full wrath of God. And that is pain that you and I, we will never know. We may know what it's like to lose a loved one. You may know what it's like to go through loss, but we will never know what it's like to go through the pain of the cross. Praise Jesus that instead of turning and the running in the opposite direction, he saw the path that the father had laid before him. And he said, Father, glorify your name. Verse 28, then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. How good is our God. This is one of three instances in all the gospels that an audible voice comes down from heaven. Once at Jesus' baptism and the second at his transfiguration. So to say that this is kind of a big deal is an understatement. What this voice is saying is that God the Father has been glorifying himself through the life and ministry of Jesus all the way up to this point. 
And it's not just through the sermons he's given. It's not just through the miracles he's performed. It's not even just through the discipleship of his 12, but it's also through him being willing to wash his disciples' feet and to sit and eat with tax collectors and sinners. God the Father has been glorified. And this glory, it doesn't just stop at Jesus' death, but it will continue on through his resurrection, which we get to celebrate tomorrow and Sunday. Jesus' death is a glorifying event because it marks the end of Jesus's mission. His death will bring the seeds of salvation and will make the way for us to receive eternal life as long as we place our faith in him. Our main point tonight is die to yourself and live in Christ so that you may receive glory and honor from the Father. Dying to ourselves is no easy task. It wasn't easy for Jesus and it won't be for us, but it is 100% worth it. The cost of a relationship with Jesus is your life. It's your life. But that cost pales in comparison to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, our Lord. For tonight, our only next step takeaway is with God, Will you ask the Holy Spirit to help you examine your own heart and search out any ways in which you may not be dying to yourself? After repenting of your sin, you may come and receive the elements from our elders and pastors and partake in communion. As we partake of the bread and juice, and as we ask the elders to come up as well and the pastors to come and prepare to give uh, communion, Communion is a physical representation of Jesus' body and blood that was shed. When we take it, what we are saying is, thank you, Jesus, for the blood supplied. Thank you, Jesus, for the physical and spiritual toil that you went through, the pain you went through, so we didn't have to. Communion is for someone who's placed their faith in Jesus and is a follower of Christ. So that, they can, so that we can come and thank him for his sacrifice. And tonight, communion, as you can tell, looks a little differently. There's tables around the stage and then two on the sides and two up in the balcony. And what at each table will be either an elder or a pastor who is going to hand you the elements. And what they're gonna do is they are going to break the bread so you can see him, them breaking the bread and they'll hand you the piece of bread and say, die with him. At that moment, you'll take the bread and you'll eat it. And then after you eat your bread, they'll then, then hand you the juice and say, live with him. And you'll take the juice and then you can leave. We ask as you leave uh, that you would be respectful of everyone. So we're asking not just as you leave the room, but as you leave the building to remain silent so you can respect and honor the people around you who are still partaking. We also wanna invite you if, if you feel like you just have, need to have a conversation with the Lord and take a moment reflecting on his sacrifice, reflecting on your life, we encourage you to do that in this room. It's gonna be silent. There's not gonna be any music and you can just sit and be in the presence of God. And if you find yourself here, realizing that you haven't placed your faith in Jesus and died to yourself, well, we would love to walk you through that process. If you're interested, we'll have prayer partners over here to your right in the alcove who would love to pray with you. In closing, before we go to communion, John 6, 53 through 58 says, so Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I'll raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food and my blood is is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. 
as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father. So whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. Will you pray with me? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for Good Friday. The sacrifice that you made, the payment you paid. Lord, you reign above it all. God, I just pray that as we have a moment to reflect on what you've done, on the, on the price that you've paid, God, I pray that you would humble our hearts, that we would see our sin clearly and see our need for, for your Savior more, all the more clearly. Lord, please fill this place, fill our hearts. It's in your name that we pray, amen. You guys may take your turns and standing up and lining up at the communion tables.